So in this video, we're going to start discussing Fresnel's equations. Uh, and I know it looks like a Fresnel for those uh, English speakers out there, uh, but it is in fact Fresnel, and that will save you some uh, embarrassment in front of optics people in the future. Now, what are Fresnel's equations? Well, you might remember from your intro physics course that if you've got some ray uh, coming in, some ray of light, and now we know that that's just equivalent to a plane wave coming down, uh, you know that some of the ray is going to be reflected, and you can calculate its angle. It's just equal to uh, the angle of incidence, so theta r is equal to theta i. And some of the ray is going to be refracted, and that's going to be with some other angle, theta t. And you can calculate that from Snell's law. So if you have the refractive index of the one material and the refractive index of the other material, you know that the relationship between theta i and theta t is Snell's law, or n1 sine theta i is equal to n2 sine theta t. But one question you might have had in that physics course, and certainly one that bothered me for a while, is how much of the wave gets reflected and how much of the wave gets refracted? Is it 80% of it gets reflected and 20% of it gets refracted? Is it 2080? Is it 100 zero? When, when is it what numbers? And the answer can be found in Fresnel's equations. So they give a relationship between the incident amplitude, so let's call this uh, EI, the reflected amplitude, say ER, and the transmitted amplitude, ET. So if we know the incident amplitude, we can use Fresnel's equations to calculate the reflected amplitude and the transmitted amplitude. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Let's try and figure out uh, how much amplitude is reflected and how much is refracted. And let's assume that initially we've got a normally incident plane wave. So it's just coming down straight from above. Uh, and this will be both the easiest case, the easiest case and the most important case. Uh, in my day-to-day -day work as a, an optical engineering graduate student, uh, Almost, almost always uh, I deal with plane waves at normal incidence because they're useful, they're easy to deal with, and they give you uh, wonderfully elegant predictions. So if this wave is propagating in the downwards direction, or it's got a k-vector pointing straight down, uh, then we can write a bunch of different possible electric and magnetic field uh, components for that. But let's assume that the electric field is pointing towards us. Uh, and then the magnetic field has to be pointing off to the left. Uh, and let me actually draw these in, in different colors. So let's draw E in white. Uh, so our electric field and our magnetic field, let's do in blue. Now initially, as the wave is propagating downwards, uh, let's call this HI, so for incident wave, and let's call this EI. So it's got some amplitude. Uh, it's got some amplitude of its electric and magnetic field. And we now know the relationship between the two uh, is just equal to the wave impedance. Um, so we can calculate, if we know the electric field, we know the magnetic field. So really they're one independent uh, quantity. So as this wave hits the boundary, it's going to reflect. And now the uh, fields are going to be pointing in slightly different directions. So let's assume that the electric field is still pointing in the same direction. Uh, and in that case, if we've got a k-vector now that's pointing up, or a wave is propagating upwards, uh, then our magnetic field has to be pointing in the opposite direction, so now towards the right. And that's just because uh, this is a plane wave, so it has to follow the right-hand rule. Uh, and that's just from Maxwell's curl equations. Um, so now it's got some also unknown amplitude. Uh, let's call this hr, so for reflected wave. And it's got some... Uh, electric field reflected amplitude as well. And you might ask why we wrote it this way. So why is HR pointing to the right and ER still pointing the same direction? Um, well, the answer is that it, it actually shouldn't matter how you do it uh, because this is at normal incidence. And you really could do it either way and you'd end up with the same answer. Um, but this is the conventional way uh, of doing these calculations. And so our um, our results will agree with what all the standard textbooks say. But we know the wave isn't just going to reflect, it's also going to have some component that transmits through this interface. And so that's, uh, that's pretty simple. That's everything still pointing in the same exact directions. So H is still off to the left, 
E is still pointing towards us. And let's call this uh, HT for the transmitted field. Similarly, we've got ET for the transmitted electric field. Let's say that these materials or this interface, uh, both these materials are non-magnetic. So one has a refractive index N1, the other has a refractive index N2. And so underneath, this is all one material. Above this interface is all one material. Okay, we've set everything up, but now what? Uh, we're, it looks like we're kind of we're kind of stuck. What do we what do we do now? Um, and the answer is what we've been going over in the previous videos. So we want to know how much light or how much of this electromagnetic wave is reflected from the interface. In other words, we want to know what's going on exactly at the interface or on either side of the interface. And for this, you might recognize uh, we'll want to use our boundary conditions. So we'll want to use the, uh, the boundary conditions we developed for the electric and the magnetic field. And remember for uh, the electric field, this was just that the tangential field uh, in region one, so tangential to this interface, uh, has to be equal to the tangential field on the second side, so in the second material. So the electric field right at the edge here and the electric field right at the edge here have to be equal to each other. And similarly, if we assume there's no uh, current density on this at this interface, the tangential component of the magnetic field in on this on the first in the first material right at the edge of the interface has to be equal to the tangential field in on the other side. Now the nice thing about normal interf uh, normal incidence is all of our fields are tangential. So this H field is tangential to this interface. This electric field is also tangential to this interface because we're assuming that the material goes out infinitely in these two directions. So it's a plane, uh, not just a not just a line. Now the other nice thing is because we're working at this interface, so we're working at let's say z equals zero if this is the the z axis, we don't have to worry about the fact that these are waves, uh, or rather we don't have to worry about their e to the j omega t minus k z shenanigans um, because we're evaluating everything at the same location z equals zero, and all the time components will just cancel out, we've got no spatial dependence and no time dependence. So at least in the case of normal incidence, we don't have to worry about the, the phase of the field. We only have to worry about its amplitude, or rather its uh, amplitude coefficient. So these just translate directly into two equations that we can actually use. So what's the tangential field uh, on the first side? Well, we've got the our incident field, EI, We've also got our reflected field, ER. So uh, this is on side one. Uh, on the second side of the interface, we've just got our transmitted field, ET. And similarly, for the magnetic field, we've got our incident magnetic field that we have to worry about. We've also got our reflected magnetic field. But these two are pointing in opposite directions because the, the plane waves are propagating in opposite directions. So we actually have to subtract uh, HR. And this is all equal to the transmitted H field. And now we can use the wave impedance on either side, so the wave impedance of either material, to get everything in terms of the electric or the magnetic field. Uh, generally, people use the electric field, so that's what we're going to do. So if we just plug that in, uh, we, we know that HI and HR are both, they both exist on, uh, in this material, so they've got a wave impedance eta1, so EI over eta1 minus ER over eta1 has to equal ET. And now uh, the transmitted wave exists in material two, so it's got wave impedance eta2. And we know we can relate these to the refractive indices because uh, eta for a non-magnetic material is just eta naught over n. And so the refractive index comes up top and we've got n2. Uh, and here we've got, for both of these guys, we've got n1. And I'm gonna put that. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna put that here. So n1 ei minus er. And so now we've got two equations in terms of what looks like three unknowns: the incident electric field 
the reflected electric field, and the transmitted electric field. But really it's not two unknowns because we can make this incident field whatever we want. So this is known. Our incident field, we assume that we're applying some incident field and we want to know the resultant uh, reflected electric field and transmitted electric field. So here's our equation one, here's our equation two. And you can actually solve these equations. And so if we do that, uh, you can get that the reflected magnetic or the reflected electric field is just N1 minus N2 over N1 plus N2 times the incident electric field. And you can also calculate the transmitted electric field. This is just equal to two N1 divided by N1 plus N2 times our incident field. And so we've done it. This is actually our the final answer. We know now if we have if we know the refractive indices of our material n1 and n2 uh, and we know the incident wave, if we know how much maybe how much power we're sending at the surface, we can calculate the reflected wave. And so this quantity here, or these quantities, are, are so important they have their own coefficients. So we call this uh, coefficient r. So if we were to rewrite this, uh, our reflected field is just r times our incident field. So this is the reflection amplitude coefficient. And similarly, this is t, our transmitted coefficient. So we could write ET, our transmitted field, is just equal to T times EI. And this is at normal incidence. So in general, R and T are going to be different as we vary our angle of incidence theta. And we'll go over what that looks like in future videos. Now, these amplitude reflection coefficients, as, as they're called, or the amplitude transmission coefficient, uh, these are really fundamental because they allow you to calculate pretty much anything you want. Um, so, like, when we deal with thin films uh, or multilayer stacks, you can use R and T of each stack at each interface uh, to calculate the total reflected field. Um, similarly, if you, if you know the, not the field, but the intensity coming down, um, you know that's just proportional to the square of the electric field, which means that it's proportional, or the, let's say that we want the reflected power, that's just proportional to the magnitude squared of the reflection coefficient. And similarly, the transmitted power is proportional, or is actually just, sorry, equal to um, the reflection coefficient and equal to the magnitude of the transmission coefficient squared. And so these capital R and capital T, oh, uh, capital R and capital T are in terms of power or intensity um, these little r and little t, which is what we just dealt with, these are in terms of amplitude. So these are our fields, our electric fields. These are our powers or our intensities. And you can derive these relationships very quickly just using this fact. Now, coming back to the beginning, uh, what if we had assumed instead that the electric field had been the one that flipped sign? So it went from pointing towards us to pointing away from us. Uh, well, if we were to do that, then we'd get a different value for R. In fact, we'd get a, a negative of this value. So we'd have N2 minus N1 instead of N1 minus N2. And that compensates for this flip that we assumed. So uh, the, the beauty of this is that physics, uh, physics works no matter, no matter how you decide to uh, set up your conditions. This is just the standard way of doing things. This is the one that you'll see in textbooks and on Wikipedia. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did, please give it a like down below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.